I'm a rolling, I'm a rolling through an unfriendly world. I'm a rolling, I'm a rolling through an unfriendly world. Oh, mother, won't you help me? Oh, mothers, won't you help me to pray? Oh, mothers, won't you help me? Won't you help me in the service of the Lord? Welcome to Clinton Church Restoration's online community read of The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois. The mission of Clinton Church Restoration is to create an African-American heritage site and cultural center at the historic Clinton AME Zion Church in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, where W.E.B. Du Bois was born and raised. As a cultural hub inspired by Du Bois' work as a seminal writer, scholar, and activist, this new center will use interpretive exhibits and contemporary programming to explore his complex life and legacy, celebrate the work of this Freedom Church, and share hidden and untold stories of African American life in rural New England. Our 14-week community read of The Souls of Black Folk will be moderated by Dr. Francis Jones Sneed, historian, board member, and chair of our Scholars Council. Each week, she will be joined by a guest scholar for a presentation of a single chapter of Du Bois's classic text, followed by a discussion with the audience. If you are joining us live, we invite and appreciate your participation. Please enter your questions into the Q&A box. For best results, we recommend you have the most recent version of the Zoom app downloaded on your device. Attendees watching via a browser may not have all the interactive features available. To see the full schedule for this community read or to learn more about the project, please visit our website at clintonchurchrestoration.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm a rolling, I'm a rolling through an unfriendly world. I'm a rolling, I'm a rolling, I'm a rolling through an unfriendly world. I'm a rolling, I'm a rolling through an unfriendly world. Good evening, and welcome to our ninth session of the community reading of W.E.B. Du Bois' The Souls of Black Folk. We are pleased to have with us this evening, Dr. Dolan Hubbard. Dr. Hubbard is a retired professor and chairperson of the Department of English and Language Arts at Morgan State University in Baltimore. He is the author of The Souls of Black Folk, 100 Years Later and other titles. He has been the recipient of fellowships from Harvard University, where he was a Ford Foundation Fellow at the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute. We will begin with remarks from Dr. Hubbard, followed by your questions. Please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time. Welcome, Professor Hubbard. We are pleased to have you here. Good evening. I'm glad to be here and I want to say what a blessing and what an honor to be invited by Dr. Francis uh, Jones Sneed and the other members of the Clinton Church uh, Restoration uh, Committee. I first learned of Du Bois when I went to Winston-Salem State University as an instructor. Wasn't even dreaming about earning a doctorate. And I met him in Black Writers in America, the anthology, historic anthology of Black literature. And when I came to Baltimore about 21 years ago, I found out to quote Toni Morrison, quite as it said, as it's been said, Du Bois and his wife lived in Baltimore about 10 to 12 years in the late 40s, early 50s. Their daughter taught her high school in Baltimore. Uh, it's, my uh, topic this evening of the sons of master and man. Um, chapter nine was originally titled The Relation of Negroes to Whites in the South and it was published in 1901. 
and I have subtitled this as Civilization and its Discontent. Uh, chapter nine is informed, though it's not present in the chapter, by one of the most striking words in Du Bois's vocabulary, and that is uh, riddle. And we will talk about riddle and other keywords, riddle, civilization, and parable, and how they are woven through this. And I should add a fourth word, and that is Janus, because this chapter, if you know anything about Roman god Janus, whom some people say January is named for, but Janus is reputedly can look forward and backwards. So in chapter nine, Du Bois looks both forward back to the to the beginning of the souls of black folks and towards the end of the uh, souls of um, black folk. And we can go to uh, the second slide. I call it Du Bois in the Shakespearean interrogatory. And by that, I simply mean that, I'm, that I go back to Hamlet, you know, to be or not to be. That's the Shakespearean in interrogatory. Because you want to know, and I want to know, who is who are the sons, who is the master, and who is the man? in a society by state sanction, uh, at least when Du Bois uh, was writing this at the turn of the century, in a society was, that was state sanctioned laws that you lived in the world that were black and white. And as I talk about this, uh, sort of a parallel text, if you wanna say, if you wanna look for a parallel text, I would make the argument is Tony Morrison's The Blue Side that I have a, a little bit more to say about it. Because in a world where uh, that is divided into black and white, uh, who is the master, who is the man, and who is the son? And let me just leave that for one moment because I do want to talk about the word civilization. Du Bois mentioned civilization, and civilization is a, it was an ideologically loaded term because implicit in civilization is a hierarchy. Who is advantage and who is disadvantage? So the master will be the man of the house. The son, it says sons, one son we know would be his white son and he would what? Benefit from ascending patriarchy. So when his father dies, he gets the benefits and then the, what the, uh, the, what am I trying to say? The, um, the money passes from the father's generation to the son, but the black son, he has a descendant patriarchy. He doesn't receive any of those benefits. He doesn't inherit anything except what? More fear and dread and pain. So now you understand why Du Bois just titled chapter nine of the son of master and man. And this brings in the word I mentioned earlier, a parable. A parable takes place in time and across time because a parable is basically is um, an ethical issue in many ways or a challenging issue because one is confronted with some, and it, one is confronted and then situational ethics, how do you respond? And arguably the most famous past, uh, parable in the Christian world is the Good Samaritan with its own question, who is my neighbor? Or you can reverse the question, to whom am I a neighbor to? So these are in the background, we're talking about civilization. This explains the Du Bois's, takes us back to Du Bois's original title about the relation of Negroes to the whites in the South. And he did not do a lot of modification to this um, when he revised this into his new title, because he is talking about the interaction between white people 
and black people in the American South. So we're basically talking about a racial caste system. How do you break the chains and manacles of a racial caste system? Well, Du Bois, the wordsmith that he is, he tries to do this through his words and the souls of black folks. And he gives us a hint, a teaser, if you will, in his prologue. This is without, this is without, this is not without interest to you, gentle reader. The gentle reader is his sort of a, what straw man, this person, he's going on a tour across the American South. And his goal is what? Try to humanize black people to, and, and the greater moral issue is to uh, say to America, you need to live up to the promise of your august national documents, namely Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence and then the, um, the Constitution, what we have in our law. So what Du Bois says, and let me see, he talked in, in looking at the, the, um, the, um, the four groups, I've lost my words, but there's the contacts, there's four forms of the contact. There is um, social, there is economic, and I, can't, I cannot see the uh, slide before me. I just see on my screen, it says this meeting has been, okay, I see it now, the world old philosophy, yes, about the contacts of, um, the, uh, the white and the black. So there's his main thing is there is there is law there is largely almost no meaningful contact. There's almost no meaningful contact as far as sincere contact to have the communities grow together. So Du Bois uh, speaks to this from addresses this from the standpoint of if we can make sense out of this, if the best of the black people and the best of the white people could get together, then we would reach some uh, understanding and move both communities forward and we will move uh, people out of their fixed position. See, that's the parable. And I was thinking about when I was in college in the late sixties, a man by the name broke onto the, onto this, cinematic scene, Clint Eastwood, those movies, Fistful of Dollars, Few Dollars More, and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And in some ways, those movies were parables, although the characters had their name, but most of the time, they did not give the characters name, but you understood who was a good character, who was gonna try to have some ethics, and who was gonna be the bad character. So Du Bois's approach to, um, the con to the to the to the style of this chapter is to present the people with no name because we are fixed in this patriarchal system, a system in which black folks are reduced to what he says in um, the Dust of Dawn chapter that uh, when he looks at Reconstruction, that the black man when he goes to court the black man and the ox are treated the same. What's the difference between a man or a woman and an animal? How do you resolve this? Uh, one way you can resolve this from Du Bois's perspective is through education. And that gets us to the riddle. What is the riddle in this? The riddle of the Sphinx, and many of you are familiar with this from Oedipus's story. Not a, a Sophocles' story of Oedipus. And Oedipus is confronted with the riddle. And he has to answer this riddle, either live or die. And you know the riddle. What walks on two in the morning, three at noon, and four to, what walks on one in the morning, uh, two at noon, and three in the afternoon. And of course, it is a man. So Du Bois takes the riddle 
but he is not so much interested in the riddle of the Sphinx except to look at what is man? What is man? That's the question that Du Bois is looking at actually through the entire souls of black folks. How do you define the human? That's the central question in the souls of black folks. How do you define the human? Do we as African descended people have all the rights and privileges that the other group have? Or are we reduced to being a beast and a burden? That is the central question. That is the thread that runs throughout the uh, souls of black folk. Now, Du Bois would say, if you don't understand what I am saying, then I would give it to you in a short story. And that is of the coming of John. So uh, I'm not gonna go, go into of, of the coming of John, but when you look at the totality of the souls of black folk, Du Bois is saying, if you don't understand what I have been trying to convey, then I give it to you in the only short story that's in the souls of black folk, and that is of the common of John. Again, where, whereas in what, chapter nine, you could say no name in the street, to quote the right Reverend James Baldwin, but in uh, chapter 10, um, of the coming of John, he named the John. And again, stylistically speaking, one is white, one is black. They grow up together. They go their different ways. And that's all I'm gonna say about it because I don't wanna give it away. But you see the roots of it in of, in of the story of of the sons of master and man. How do you define the human? So Du Bois is say, put, presents this here as well as in his opening uh, chapter that sets the tone for the souls of black folk of our spiritual strivings that you work at double aims, cross purpose, trying to be as the, as the then basketball coach of the, what, the um, Los Angeles Clippers who is now the coach of the Philadelphia uh, 76ers, he said, we love America, but America does not love us back. And let me return to education. Um, du Bois looks at the riddle of existence, the riddle of the world, and the riddle of the life. And I didn't riddle in the in the uh, pre-Christian world, and it came into the Christian world to a degree, is based on a perforation, it's based on dark stories, it's also based on the assumption that the person who's raising the riddle, uh, presenting the riddle to someone, has is very bright, intelligent, understands some of the dynamics of what, rhetoric and persuasion. So all of that is in is implicit in the riddle, but a riddle ultimately is also about a what? A dark story. And we see this in the souls of black folks, this, this dark story, black people trying to see themselves through this veil, trying to see themselves through a glass darkly. How do you get out of this, these, what these caves, not, the walls of this cave that is closing in on you is what Du Bois asked us in, um, in, of our, in number, chapter one of our spiritual strive, how do you get out of it? In other words, how does a community keep mind and body together? Now, Du Bois, who is, as we know, one of the most formally educated people in the world, I would argue that the break comes when he does his uh, piece on uh, the conversation of races uh, prior to that point, he basically wrote in the dispassionate voice. And I would say that's where he made the transition and shifted more towards uh, taking all of his, what, mathematical skills, history skills, the new field of sociology and the social sciences to humanize black people as he and his uh, gender reader make somewhat, you might say, their, roughly their pilgrim's progress 
in the souls of black folks in his determination to try not only to uplift black people, but to have the larger population, the dominant uh, European population to see black people as human, as human beings. Um, but for Du Bois, when the riddle, the ultimate riddle is for Du Bois is education of black people. Rather than the industrial education where you are trained to basically be what? Have an inferior education. Du Bois always has his mind on uh, the Washington who is the, what, the major proponent of industrial education. And I should be abundantly clear on one point. Um, du Bois is, is not against people uh, being uh, what? Brig Masons, uh, industrial traders, we would say today. Du Bois's fundamental complaint is, and looking back to what the, the, uh, the um, education in the world of uh, Plato and Aristotle and so so uh, uh, Plato, Aristotle and Socrates, this is his sort of what intellectual yardstick, measuring stick when he is thinking about uh, education, that if we have black children who have the ability to run faster, jump higher, then they should not be denied that. And so that's why Du Bois, he doesn't call out Booker T. Washington uh, in, by name anymore. But in this chapter and other chapters, implicitly, when he's talking about education is always on his mind. The riddle of existence for Du Bois is the, is the type of education that uh, people received under Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. In other words, this was education primarily for um, I guess we would say it's the equivalent of uh, going to some of the better schools around in small group session, and you had the basics, what we would call today the liberal arts and the humanities. That was your fundamental foundation. In other words, we're talking about what? Education for, for life, lifelong living, lifelong earning. Lifelong learning, I'm sorry. So it's education for life. So Du Bois is looking for something com comparable for black students. Again, for the United States to live up to the words of its, um, of its documents. Um, and we have a, a slide in there on the uh, plantation. And the reason I included that slide is the plantation, this is a romantic vision of the plantation. The plantation house, the Mississippi River, the two ladies dressed on a leisurely, for a leisurely walk. But this grand romantic vision, it hides more than what the person sees, the dread, the pain, the monotony, doing the same thing over and over. It benefits the, um, the master, but we know the master and the family, they also live in a certain degree of what? Fear because they never know when the enslaved may rise up against their what? The, the theft of their level, the, the theft of their labor and their, uh, their, their degraded status being marked off, set aside as a caste. The meaning signifying that one is what? Inferior, less than, unequal. How does one make sense of this 
and keep mind and body together. So yes, the four lines of contact between blacks and whites in the South, basically a nation within the nation. And Du Bois writes a little bit more about this in Dust of Dawn. By a nation within a nation, there's the physical proximity of homes and dwelling places. There are the economic relations, the political relations, and the fourth and the less tangible but highly important forms of intellectual contact and commerce, the interchange of ideas through conversation and conference. And of course, of those four uh, contacts between blacks and white, the fourth one is where there is the least amount of contacts because you may have what? You, you, not you may have, but you have a larger number of white people who are, who are formally educated and what Du Bois refers to as the good people, but certainly numerically, numerically there are fewer black people who have even the time to think about intellectual exchange and contact when you basically are assigned to do physical labor. Uh, so Du Bois wants to know how do we break through this? And in fact, he says this term, tertum quid. It means a third thing. You're not black, you're not white, you are something else. Who are you? Uh, I will give one example from my uh, uh, life. I used to, a gentleman, he's gone to glory now, it was in North Carolina, in Kannapolis, North Carolina. The big meal was called Cannon. And this gentleman told me that uh, he was a teacher, but he uh, moonlighted in the uh, South by coming to places like uh, what, uh, Perth Amboy, New Jersey, Jersey City, to make money during the summer. He said the, the, the uh, wife of the cotton mill owner, the patriarch, she knew his name, but every time she saw him, he had to respond by a different name. He had to smile and take it and accept it, even though he knew that he was not the name that she called him. But what are you gonna do in a patriarchal society? Because you, if you uh, respond in a negative sense, then you know you could be uh, sanctioned. In conclusion, in concluding, uh, let me talk about sympathy. That's the fourth. That's the fourth term, because Du Bois concludes by talking about we need broad sympathy, meaning blacks and whites. We need to talk to each other, work together to try to resolve some of these issues. But broad sympathy has another level of meaning. For broad, for Du Bois, broad sympathy also means. The education, again, this whole idea of education is always on Du Bois's mind. So when we look at education, we're talking about broadly uh, the humanities at their best. This is what Du Bois is talking about, to provide Black students opportunity to have some of the best education. Uh, you may want to maybe even expand it. Education plus the culture that comes with it the social skills, the social graces. And again, as I said earlier, you know, education for life. This is what he's, he wants black folks, to, black people to be in a position to aspire for that and to achieve it. Du Bois in some ways is a, a living testimony to what he is saying here because he tells us in, um, uh, his autobiography and then Dust of Dawn that had the gentleman who was the teacher at the principal of his school in Great Barrington had another mindset. He would have directed Du Bois to another direction, but he saw that he was a very preco precocious student and therefore he opened Du Bois to the languages, the Greek and Latin. Without the Greek and the Latin, he would not have any chance to, to have received the 
education that he received at uh, Harvard. But before he got to Harvard, when he went to Fisk, uh, the, the uh, faculty was predominantly uh, white and male, and many of those men were from um, New England or the Midwest with New England roots. So he was right at home academically because they had these, uh, you know, the, the standards that help him move uh, forward. In concluding, I would say this. Let me see. I, I, let me see if I find my page. I wrote one thing down. Du Bois, who I can't find it. Um, du Bois. Um, in his last riddle was talking about one day, will uh, we be able to achieve, arrive at the greater good? You know, there's a God, he doesn't say this, but I'm gonna interpret it. That is a God that sits high and looks low. So Du Bois uh, uses the word from the um, world of antiquity, the world of, Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, the eternal good. I would um, give a corrective to Du Bois coming through his fantastic biographer and fellow Fiskite, um, David Levin Lewis. Uh, who said that Du Bois is a serene agnostic. An agnostic simply means that one who questions God's existence. However, when Du Bois concludes this by talking about uh, the greater good, not he doesn't conclude, but when he refers to the greater good, I would say Du at that point, Dr. W.B. Du Bois, mind takes him back to those two summers that he spent in East Tennessee in 1886 and 88, when he was Willie. And he was out there those two summers around common, ordinary, everyday black people try, trying to get from one day to the next, one week to the next, and one year to the, to the next year. And I would make the argument that at that point, the eminent W.E.B. Du Bois ends up in the same place as he was with many of those brothers and sisters out there in Middle Tennessee. But God, thank you. Oh, one let me, let me say before God, let me say, excuse me, one of the last moment. I have a picture because I don't want us to leave here uh, on a sort of um, down in a downward angle, but I want us to be in an angle of ascent. Du Bois, as many of you are aware, became the first founder and first editor of the uh, Crisis. And in this very last frame here, you see a man and a woman. And Du Bois's aesthetics and politics converge on the textual meeting ground a representation where he makes manifest priority one, the black family formation. So four years after he founded the crisis and became the editor, he put on the cover a black man and a black woman, well-dressed husband and wife. They could be on their way to, um, to, the, to, the, to church. They could be on their way to a play, the opera, Du Bois is saying, in spite of the um, roadblocks that's been placed in, in front of Black people, we are striding. And that really is a key word to uh, the souls of Black folks, striding, keep going forward. You're striding, your resil resilience, determination, and a word, we are not going to let anybody turn us around. Thank you. Um, it's so good to to see you. <laughs> and uh, uh, Lena Apatu is in the uh, in the audience listening. Yes, to Lena. You. She lives in the neighborhood of where Du Bois lives. She yes, tour guide. <laughs> she says hello. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right, we have a, a couple of questions. Um, Karen mm -hmm. Stein says, hello, Dr. Hubbard too, so. My classmate from Catawba College. <laughs> All right, so yeah, first question here is from Ray Gunn, and Mr. Gunn is the president of uh, Clinton Church Restoration. Uh, by talking in parables and riddles, Du Bois does not seem to be messaging a call to action. Do you think that that was a sign of the times or that action would come from conveying the message in this way? Well, I thank you for that great question because it gives me an opportunity to say this. And I got caught up in the moment, so I can say it now. Uh, I think sometimes, uh, and I'm, particularly I'm talking about uh, the community of black scholars generally, but it's not restricted to them. I think sometimes when we look back at um, Alexander Cromwell, who was sort of the father figure for that generation, Du Bois and coming to the Harlem Renaissance, I think sometimes we, over, we tend to forget and overlook that this generation, they didn't have any models. They had to what? Live history and make history at the same time. And yet we know had they not done what they did, there would be no Martin Luther King, no Mary McLeod Bethune Cookman, no Jesse Jackson, no Barack Obama, and now Kamala Harris. So uh, yes, sir, I would say that this was more of a sign of the town. Du Bois was in the mode of probably another great person he really admired beyond beyond uh, uh, Cromwell, and that's Frederick Douglass. He was fighting with words, and that was his uh, method of trying to uh, advance the struggle and the fight for freedom. And there was a thing about Du Bois is uh, the point that you raise is a legitimate question, but the point about Du Bois is the older he, the older he lived, the more radical he became. So that's something for us to think about when we write our memoirs. <laughs> it would become more radical. <laughs> that's very yeah. interesting. Um, <laughs> Mr. Everett Brinsom asked, when I attended high school in Great Barrington's in the 1950s, the same one that Du Bois attended, Latin was still taught. Yes. Yeah. Which is important. Um, Lou Fields asks, hello, Dr. Hubbard. Uh, du Bois writes that racial prejudice is, quote, dangerous for the future, unquote. And also state that, quote, one of the greatest weapon is the power of the ballot, unquote. Contrast the, his statements with the two recent uh, votes in Georgia and the riot uh, uh, Wednesday at the U.S. Capitol. Boy, what a big question that is. Yeah. Right, the struggle for, um, for the ballot. And uh, let me say this, I'm sure some in order is already aware of this. The 14th Amendment, you know, the, the free the slaves, but yet it had in there a, a, a what, by, was it three or four words? Unless someone uh, has gotten on the wrong side of the state, I'm butchering it. Do you understand the spirit of it? For those three to four words, open the door for these Southerners who are angry to see their property walking around free to, to then what? Uh, put you back into what? Uh, basic slavery all over again. Slavery, in fact, someone has written a book, Slavery by Another Name. And so this whole issue of repressing the vote has a long record. We are hoping and praying that the Congress will finally approve the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Hopefully that will be among the first three to five uh, bills that uh, Joe Biden will approve. And if so, then we can say, hello, Stacey Abrams. You can bring five, six, seven, or 12 
of sisters and brothers because we need to go and vote, 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 vote. In fact, in the souls of black folks, Du Bois says in the um, chapter one of our spiritual striving, let me see if I can quote it, the, the, the ballot we need more than ever, comma, else what will save us from a second slavery, spoken by the prophet. Thank you, uh, Dr. Herbert. Uh, Jen Margo says, what makes you most optimistic today for equality in education? Well, let me see. Hope is always there. You know, our four parents, um, prayed in hope, and that's what Du Bois is saying to us in the um, souls of black folks. And I'm Du Bois at some point, and this is why I say those two years that he spent in Middle Tennessee was so valuable. This is where it became a visceral thing with um, Willie Du Bois. Uh, I quoted Shakespeare at the beginning. I'm going to quote Shakespeare again. This became interred in his bone about what it means to be Black. And Du Bois never forgot that. And that, I would say the spirit was with Du Bois when he wrote The Souls of Black Folks. Yes, you want to say he was an agnostic? I had no problem with that. But I'll make this argument that Du Bois who wrote The Souls of Black Folks it was not the agnostic. The one who wrote his other what? About 18 to 19 books. But this Du Bois was living through the experience of what happened out there. And this is what made him determined. In fact, he said, when he went from Fisk to Harvard, he went as a Negro. And when he said he was at Harvard, he said he went through through Harvard, but not to Harvard. He was in the right mind. And when I was doing my uh, research on him at the uh, University of Massachusetts Library, I need to find this in my notes. There was a Southern teacher, and Du Bois wrote him for slandering Black folks. So he was already in his uh, <laughs> Frederick Douglass, Jesse Jackson, H. Ralph Brown uh, mode. But to answer your question, we have to keep pushing and maybe uh, with uh, the Democrats in, uh, in um, control of both houses, uh, they will address some of these issues in our, um, particularly in our inner city schools. I teach at Morgan State University, one of the nation's uh, top uh, HBCUs. And I can say this, since I came in 19, what, 98, you can see over the years, uh, you know, the decline. Now, and I don't want anyone to mis misquote me or put me on Twitter. We have some excellent students, but what I mean by you can see the, 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 the decline at the Morgan and other HBCUs, when students come to school, if they come into Morgan or Florida a &M, Howard, Southern University, if they want to be in the engineering program, the sciences, the school of business. These kids, these young people, our future, let me put it that way. They generally have what? High, they're generally high achievers, so they have self-identified. So what about this, the students in other areas? That's what I'm talking about where you see this sort of the what? The, 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 uh, the pain, the academic unreadiness that many of these students uh, have suffered coming through our uh, urban schools, our inner city uh, schools. Uh, I did a op-ed or a piece several years ago that about 50% of our students don't make it from the time they get to the first grade to the 12th grade in many of these inner city schools. We've got to do our best to you know, save our future because they are our future. And yes, at Morgan, we take many of these students, they come in, 
we get them ready. I have a young, one of my former students, I was teaching a class, was it two years ago? Uh, the the, 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 uh, language, the uh, literature of the civil rights movement. And when she got a midterm, she was an English major, a small class, about maybe five English majors, about six uh, students from, because they're taking for the general education credit. And she looked at me and she was very lady, like I give her credit, but she wanted to know why did she get either that C or D at midterm? So I said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And she said, I would like to teach at a university. And then I said, lady, you need to get ready for people. When you go to the university, they're going to have a glass of uh, Chardonnay in one hand, and they're going to be trying to cut your throat with a smile in the other hand. So you need to get ready. I said, this is what you need to do. And you know what? When the second semester, oh my Lord, I was the greatest thing in the world. But that's what we have to do, give them that tough love. You have to recognize their intellectual gifts and help them get to where they need to be. And I always conclude by saying, give them Morgan, empower your president. Don't complain, empower your president. Thank you so much. Uh, William Loeb uh, has uh, not a question, but a comment. He said, Barack Obama, uh, in his recent autobiography quotes uh, that the souls of black folks as having had a big influence on him. So um, thank you. Um, uh, Alice, I will ask your question as a very last one because, uh, because it doesn't kind of go quite with the chap uh, with this chapter, but I'll come back to you. Uh, Marissa uh, Massery says, thank you, Dr. Hubbard. I noticed that Du Bois used two different metaphors of water in this chapter. First, when he speaks to the condition of the freed slave after emancipation, when he says, quote, when these variously constituted human particles are certainly thrown broadcast on the sea of life, some swim, some sink, some hang suspended, unquote. And then the second metaphor of water is later in the chapter when he says, quote, he realizes at last that silently, relentlessly, the world flows by him in two great streams. They ripple on the same sunshine. They approach and mingle their waters in seemingly carelessness. Then they divide and flow wide apart. Can you comment on the uh, pertinence of these two metaphors? All right, now I will give a third one, uh, water in a moment. Please remind me for the third one, oh, my Lord. Um, my first reaction is, what is the value, you know, of um, of black life? That's what comes into my head initially. Can you read that first one again, please? <laughs> um, we've, we've, uh, um, did this the first time and this is the first time that any, that anybody's asked us to reread one, but, um, um, I think it's been, uh, deleted. I, I understand the second part of it. The second question. Yeah. Um, Marissa, can you type, uh, real quickly in the, the two references that and you I apologize. <laughs> We all should be reading from uh, the same text, you know, like that. Uh, 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 the the Dover Thrift Edition is the cheapest edition that you know you can kind of pick up, and so yes, that's the one that we recommend everybody kind of pick up so that we'll be on the same page. Um, when these variously constituted human particles are certainly thrown broadcast on the sea of life, some swim some sink, some hang suspended. Yes. Uh, and let me let me give a shout out to uh, Dr. Carrie Cowherry when I was talking about the um, the riddles. I cannot believe this when I was editing this book and you know you you read out everybody's uh, what chapter, but I never noticed the last five, six pages where she, really talked about uh, the importance and influence of Du Bois's um, 
classical uh, training on his thinking. Now, um, what Du Bois seems to be getting at is that we may have, who knows, the next Kamala Harris, the next um, Barack Obama. That was a slave in Kentucky. He had a computer for a mind. His master didn't have to write anything down. He had a literally computer photographic memory. But look what you're using it for. Mind numbing experience. Nothing to do to, to extend you, to make you grow, to make you use the, uh, the supper mind that God has given you. So that's what Du Bois is saying. These people come, they come, they become floatsome for history. Or you can come into the inner city and see them standing on the street corner. And we know that if you're able to discipline and punish 300, 500, 2,000 men and women, you can be president of the United States. You can run Apple, you can run Google. I think it what Du Bois is getting at, what a, what a pity and a shame, and, a, and really is a crime. The immorality of morality about how so many uh, of our young, gifted and talented uh, 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 young people are they not able to reach their uh, highest height. I see in the paper from time to time, uh, people get out of jail after 10, 15 years, and now they've gotten into education, they're ready to go, but get all these what? Legal remedies saying, whoa, whoa not so fast. That because you, you finish all this in jail doesn't mean uh, the society gonna let you uh, go to the next, take the next step. Some are able to take it, there's no doubt about it. Hope I answered your question. Oh, let me give you the third reference to, uh, to water. Du Bois in this chapter, and this recurs from time to time in the souls of black folk. We're talking about the relationship between the blacks and whites, the like and these four and these four things about it being aborted. So there's another, if I could uh, use a water metaphor, the whole idea of the promise. And that's all it is, is a promise. A broken dream. The Langston Hughes is probably his greatest son, and along with Martha King. You know what happens? You know, hold fast to dreams. You know what happens to a, what? What happens to a dream deferred? And that that let me, that that takes me back to what the reason I quoted Houston Baker about the size and arrangement of people's house. Du Bois is saying that's the ultimate debasement of a people. Is you have reduced their abode of living to something, as they said. I want to say one of the novels. Six square my six square block. I believe there's a women of Brewster place, but you think about any black literature, we can talk about it across across uh what genres, uh what music. The complaint is the house. Zora Neil Hurston, there is a watching God, the grandmother lives in the shadow of the um of the um the shadow of the uh of the uh, white folks. Uh, Richard Wright, native son, shame is in the house when the boys got to get up in the morning in the same room as their mother and sister and turn their faces, shame. And of course, the house on top of the houses of all of the works of uh, Black American literature, I would argue is what? Lorraine Hansberry. Everybody knows the message from the right Reverend Lorraine Hansberry. Trying to get a house, a house that is a home. That's, that's that's beautiful. I I I think that Du Bois uses this metaphor water um, yes. uh, lots and lots of times, and in fact, that's the reason why Langston Hughes um, um, dedicated uh, his first poem, "The Negroes Think of Rivers," to yes. Du Bois. Yeah, um, and so of course, uh, the Housatonic River we say is the reason why that water metaphor is is with Du Bois still. The uh, uh, on other questions, um, there is one question that's kind of outside of the chapter, but we don't have any other questions. Uh, you guys get ready for them, uh, hopefully. But she asked, what was the genesis and reason Du Bois 
moved to Accra, Ghana? Well, I can say that, um, as I said, Du Bois became more radical the older he got. Uh, he said he did not read Karl Marx, but that's fine. Du Bois didn't have to read Karl Marx. If you live as a black person, highly educated, you, you can reach your own conclusions to critique of American, uh, what the, the economic system in America. Du Bois, then he, what, he got into it with the NAACP because he said to vote, I mean, to buy black dollars on the shop with black folks. He just got so frustrated of black folks and the NAACP said, you know, we are what? Multiracial? <laughs> we don't, <laughs> uh, we, you can't do that. But Du Bois became so frustrated that the system to see the black folk being ripped off and ripped off. We talked about this was the last week on the two, two weeks ago about chapter was it chapter eight, mm -hmm. the black belt, and how people just send people economically. So he looked at it on a global level, and finally Du Bois. Um, and I get. I think the other thing that influenced him was in the what nineteen early late forties, early fifties when he ran for what. Uh, president from the state of New York, I believe. So all of those things moved him and he has, um, he turned his back on this country because this country had turned his back on him. I have written and maybe someone can help me out here. And I'm going to write another, I've just been a little bit lazy myself. I've written at least three or four letters to the NAACP. And it basically says that when we look at the, this, is why we're talking about the, the students, this, in the letter I give the statistics about how black kids are faring, are not faring in our public school system, and I said they're they're what is it the Olympiad of the mind, the AXO. If we want to promote our children, who who's a better example of academic excellence than W. E. B. Du Bois? And then I give them chapter and verse. If W.E.B. Du Bois is good enough for the United States Post Office to have him on the postal stamp, and I named some other things that's named it under Du Bois, why isn't he good enough for the NAACP? Now, if I had the president of the uh, Great Bird NAACP in the audience, that's fine. And if he or she responds to me, I would greatly appreciate it because he or she would be the first one to respond to me. <laughs> why are they afraid of this English teacher? <laughs> But I want to keep on going. <laughs> yes, you should. Thank you so much, Dr. Hubbard. This has been a delightful evening. And um, uh, we hope that uh, and look forward to that book because the title is very enticing. So uh, we have a change of speaker for next week's discussion of chapter 10 of the Faith of the Fathers. Uh, Dr. Reginald Hildebrand will join us as this evening's guest scholar. Right. I in, look forward. Instead of Dr. Todd Allen who had to cancel. Uh, so Dr. Hildebrand is an author and retired professor of African-American history and uh, African, uh, African-American studies at the University of North Carolina. Yeah, but here, uh, go Tar Heels. <laughs> yes, so thank you so much again and uh, stay with us for a beautiful short film about the Berkshires, rich black history and a little bit about the Clinton Church Restoration Project featuring vocals by Wanda Houston, and thanks to Silo Media and many others who made this film possible. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmony of liberty let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling sea hello I'm Ray Gunn, chairman of the Clinton Church Restoration Project. 
We are creating a nonprofit center for African American history and culture at the historic Clinton Amy Zion Church in Gray Barrington, which I attended for over 70 years. The Berkshires are rich with black history that is little known and sometimes misunderstood. For example, my ancestor, Agrippa Hull, served in the Revolutionary War and was the largest black landowner in Stockbridge. Once completed, our center will tell his story and those of W.E.B. Du Bois, Reverend Esther Dozier, and many more. Please help by donating to this historic project. We need your support. Thank you. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. And before I'd be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, there's no hiding place down there. Oh, there's no hiding place down there. See, I went to the rock to hide my face. Rock crying out, no hiding place, no hiding place down there. Gonna pitch tent on the old campground. Pitch my tent on the old campground. Gonna pitch my tent on the old campground. Give that devil another round. No hiding place down there. See, there's no hiding place down there. Oh, there's no hiding place down there. See, you went to the rock to hide my face. Rock cried out, no hiding place. No hiding place down there. No hiding place down there. Oh, there's no hiding place down there.